And finally, how can I tell who is an expert whom I can reasonably believe? Judges tell me that they are besieged by experts, and they don't know whom they can trust and whom they cannot trust. I'd like, therefore, to comment and to offer some personal opinions about how I believe you can try to assess an expert witness. I would ask the following questions. What are the educational background and the training of this witness? Did the person train at a good institution and a good training program with reputable people? Second, is this person a professional witness? Does he or she make most of his living from being a witness? If the person is an itinerant witness, I would tend to have a greater level of skepticism about the testimony to be offered. Third, has the witness worked, done peer-reviewed, published research and teaching in the field or discipline in which he's testifying? Or has the person come from a totally different field and become an instant expert in epidemiology or in any other field? Does the witness always give an extreme and unequivocal position? I mentioned a few moments ago the importance of uncertainty and of changing opinions in science. Does the expert acknowledge the limitations and uncertainties and admit to the possibility of being wrong? Can the witness name other people working in the field, including some people who disagree with his position? And finally, if the witness can name those people, can the witness state the reasons why those people disagree with him? I think that these questions can provide very useful guidelines regarding the potential testimony that the witness is going to provide. Perhaps one of the major questions that epidemiologists are confronted with in the courtroom is the following. Can we derive causal inferences regarding disease in an individual? The judge will say, did this person's disease occur because of this exposure? The problem is that epidemiology is not well equipped to answer that question. Epidemiology can answer the question best whether a certain exposure has been shown to be capable of causing this disease in human populations. But in a specific individual in whom there are often multiple exposures, for example, such as at an industrial site, it may be very problematic to come to a conclusion regarding the question of whether a specific exposure has caused the disease in this individual. I mentioned earlier that the attributable risk has been used particularly by lawyers with an attributable risk of over 50% being considered by some to be an equivalent of more likely than not. But I should say that this is a use that has been made by lawyers. And this issue is discussed on page 381 of the reference manual because it is an important issue. The issue of whether we can make a draw a conclusion regarding the cause of disease, the cause of disease in a specific individual is one where epidemiologists would generally say they cannot draw that conclusion, but in which the courts are desperate to be able to draw such a conclusion, and many have therefore gone to this issue of attributable risk. It is a legal decision and not a scientific or epidemiologic decision to use attributable risk in this manner. I'd like to briefly mention a problem and that is the problem of how the data and conclusions are presented. Words have great power. And you don't have to be right or wrong to convey an opinion with subtleties of how opinions are expressed. Let me give you two examples. First, we have the question of the relative risk that I spoke to you about before as against the absolute risk. What is my level of risk? Not a comparison, just what is my level of risk as an individual? Sometimes we'll look at relative risk and say, the relative risk really shows a 20% increase. You say, gee, that's quite high. 
But then you say, well, what is the absolute risk? What is the baseline risk here? And you say, well, the risk is one in 100 million people. Well, a 20% increase of that risk is minimal. So it's not just a question of saying there's a 20% increase. The question is, what is our starting point? What is the baseline? And depending on one's opinion, one may choose to express it as a 20% increase, or one may choose to express it as a baseline risk. So we're often using the means we choose to express the risk. It may often reflects the feeling we have about whether or not there is a true risk and what we're trying to convey. Let me show you another example. Let us say we carry out a study, a clinical trial, a new therapy and an old therapy, and we look at the mortality in both groups. In one group, it's 94%, and now with the new therapy, it's 93%. Well, you might say that's really not much to write home about. I wouldn't be very impressed with that. 94 versus 93%. Doesn't look like it's having much effect. But someone else who may be advocating for the new treatment comes and says, oh no, you're not looking at it correctly. Let's look at survival with the two therapies. Survival with the old therapy was 6%. It's gone up to 7% here. We have a 16% increase in survival with these two therapies. Which is true? The answer is they're both true. Again, it's the question of how you choose to express the findings. And therefore, if you're hearing scientific testimony in the court, you have to be asking always, has this person specifically chosen a certain way to present the findings that may tend to color the conclusions? Another issue that I alluded to before is the question of whether an exposure is a risk factor or a causal factor. There is yet no unanimity among epidemiologists in defining risk factor as against causal factor. But most of my colleagues would probably say that when the evidence is not strong enough to make it a causal factor, but there is evidence of an association, we would tend to call it a risk factor. But the exact point of demarcation is not clear, and often these two terms are used interchangeably, even though they may not mean exactly the same thing. Finally, in closing, I would like to stress what I consider one of the most important issues that I've mentioned earlier. There is a tremendous need to accept uncertainty and to deal with it. And I think this reflects the difference in culture between the scientific community and the legal community. Many of my colleagues say they do not want to participate in legal proceedings. They don't want to be impeached by lawyers. They don't want to be forced into a polarized opinion about whether a certain agent caused the disease because they believe there's a level of uncertainty that would qualify their comments. And yet, when they get into the legal arena, they often feel that they are being forced to make an unequivocal statement, yes or no, regarding whether or not a substance caused the disease in this person. Now, I believe there is a tremendous need for us to bridge the legal and scientific communities by having a dialogue to see how can we make both groups more comfortable with each other so that scientific evidence can be best used in the cause of justice and of truth. Thank you.